move that camera and it wants to move again, then I move it, then it stops and it keeps moving. That's what it was doing. <laughs> so, um, anyway, it's good to see everybody here today. Um, and uh, like I said, we've got quite a bit to cover. There's one thing that I missed uh, a while ago is, is uh, Christian Good Shepherd uh, in Longview had left a message stating that on March 21st, the churches can get a COVID vaccine um, by going to our email. And then you got to sign up um, by March the 15th. And uh, I've got a number here to call that, that, that there's another email that we need to sign up on because... The email they gave is one that Corey set up. It's his personal email. <laughs> I don't think the previous pastor wants his, his email address, personal email stuff full, so I'll take care of that. But there's an opportunity for us to sign up there. So I think most everybody here has a way to, to uh, may have already got it and already uh, 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 getting it anyway. So, But they're allowing that for, for churches. So anyway, um, so we got quite a bit to cover um, we have uh, Daniel, we're, we're moving into, um, we're still in the historical part, uh, but we probably get to one of the most, I guess, some ways confusing uh, chapters, in some ways, uh, of, of Daniel um, that we can. It's got all this imagery, got all this, this dream and everything, and it's hard to understand. Um, this... Uh, poster back here that I've got up uh, uh, helps explain some of that and I've got that also in uh, one of our sheets. It gives us an idea about what we're doing. So um, we, uh, we need to understand that God is always in control of history. Um, is it Isaiah 46.10 that God says that I declare the end from the beginning? Um, there's nothing that's a surprise to him. You know, uh, he knows how the end is going to completely work out. We sit here and see things in a linear fashion because we're bound by time. Uh, we're, we live in time. And so we're here. We can only see present and past and, and kind of see what's going on now, but we really can't see much that's going on in the future. Uh, we can kind of see that and understand, but not much. Um, God sees everything from before there was even the, the universe to the complete end to the eternal state. Everything is in one piece all together. And he has that ability because he's not bound by time. And so history, uh, he understands exactly what's going to happen. He knows how it's going to happen. It's all going to work uh, his way. And he's in control of it completely. Um, that's one of the big things that's different about Christians over those who live in the world today who are secular or not, not Christians is because um, they can't understand that. Um, they have no idea what the future holds for them. Uh, everything that they uh, live for is here, right here and now. Their job now, uh, the circumstances now, this is all they have to live for. They have nothing else. They don't know about nothing else. They're not, they don't think they're going to experience anything as eternity. They don't understand that. Christians look at it as like, well, we're here only for a short time. This is a tent. This is not our home. <laughs> this is it. Now, we work hard for things, and we want to be able to take care of our families and, and have things for our kids, that, you know, and all those things. But we understand all this stuff's temporary, and we're looking uh, 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 forward. We're looking for our, our day of rewards and our day of redemption, our day of being with Jesus forever. That's where we're going to be. We're only here a very small amount of time. And we want to be in eternity with Jesus in his presence. So um, that is just the way it is. But history, um, or the, the study of eschatology is the study of last things or whatever. It's really history in advance. And that's what God knows. He knows the history that is yet to happen. Okay, And he understands that. And uh, God uh, uh, has told us long ago in advance about different things. And the book of Daniel is written during a time when uh, the nation of Israel is outside the land and they're in captivity and, and God's raised up Daniel to act as a prophet uh, during this time to help explain that to his people and, and to help understand that. 
Now, how do you live uh, for God outside of the land? You know, the, the temple is gone. There's no way to bring sacrifices. All the things they did is gone. They can only follow the law that they were given and their practices as best they can. But a lot of that stuff is gone. And he is there to, to be that example to them. And he was all the way through his life. They could look to him and see how to live. He, he moved on up into the government. He would have been well known amongst everybody there and all the other Jewish captives and how he lived and what he did. And they would, he would have been an example for them to follow uh, with them to continue to, to hold their culture together of praying and, and uh, living together and doing what they need to do for God, following the, the laws as best that they can. I don't know if they were allowed to keep their Sabbath uh, completely or how, how much it was, but they were able to do some things. So they did all that they can. Um, how do you uh, uh, live for God in a pagan territory? How do you work for a boss that doesn't agree with your Christian worldview? Um, you know, I've had most bosses that I've had have been pretty good towards it. I've had some that were completely against it. And it's very difficult because they have, when it gets down to it, they have no morals, no, you know, anything immoral, unethical, illegal, doesn't matter as long as you get the job done. You know, there's those kind of people. And um, because they don't have really anything there except what's to keep them in check, uh, you know, because they don't believe in none of that. Uh, how do you sit under these professors at college who want to tell you about millions of years and you were just a blob, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, all those things you have to deal with and classmates who have this completely different worldview than, than what you have and the way you've been uh, raised and the way you understand the Bible to be. Um, so we see that. Now we see uh, chapters 1 through 7 is historical. That's the section that we've been working through, 8 through 12 are prophetic. We're coming near to the end of this uh, section one of the book uh, where we uh, go into to, uh, 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 the historical part and, and uh, we see that what Daniel is doing there. They're in captivity uh, several hundred miles outside of, of, uh, of where, uh, where they are, of where, they're, they're, uh, where Israel was from Judah and all that. So we see that and, and it is. Um, and we got a, a little bit of an outline that I have, we have the uh, historical setting in chapter seven, which is in verse one. Then we see the vision that he's gonna have in, in verse two through 14. The vision's interpretation is chapter, uh, verses 15 through 27, and the personal impact that it has on Daniel is in, in verse 28. But that's our, our uh, uh, outline that we're gonna be working with. Um, anyway, uh, uh, So we start here in the historical setting, um, and let's uh, pull up our scripture and go to uh, go to Daniel chapter seven. It's where we'll be, and we'll read through chapters uh, verse uh, one through seven, and it's probably about as far as we're going to get today. So Daniel chapter seven verse one it says, "In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed." Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, and four great beasts come up from the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion it had, and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man and as a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in, in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. And after this I behold and lo another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and clamped, uh, stamped the residue with its feet of it and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had 10 horns. 
So we see a lot of stuff going on here uh, in, this, in this vision that Daniel has. Um, this is, is, we see now that it says, uh, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, this is the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, it allows us to date the chapter. Uh, there's several dates given to the book of Daniel, but knowing what we know about the Babylonian uh, chronology, we can date this chapter to 553 B.C. And, uh, uh, you know, we know exactly when it is. You say, well, uh, you know, what difference does it make? Um, you know, it's, because, it's important because the dates are important because God's revealing to Daniel uh, the history in advance. And uh, 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 we, we see that, that there's uh, uh, so many that will try to attack the date and say, well, Daniel wrote about stuff that had already happened. He wrote it much later. Uh, you know, God can't tell you what's going to happen in the future. Uh, you know, how would he know that? It's impossible. So he must have written this after it already happened at a different date. And that's what a lot of folks will try to say. It's where, uh, uh, you know, your, your kids will probably hear if they're watching TV or something that goes on about it, some, uh, you know, uh, History Channel thing or whatever will say something about it. But, um, you know, uh, 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 that's one of the things that makes the Bible stand out against any other holy book and anything else, of any other religion, any other uh, competing religion is that it has prophecy in it that becomes fulfilled. It has those that are writing about stuff that has not happened yet. And that's the, that's the difference. Um, no other book has that. They may have all kinds of uh, pithy sayings and this and that and all, whatever else it has in the book. I don't know if you've read through some of them, like uh, uh, some of these books that are out there. If you read through like even the, the, uh, the Quran and different things, you read that and there's all kinds of stuff. There's nothing about prophecy in it and where it was spoken hundreds of years before and fulfilled exactly. None of them have that in there, but the Bible is full of it. In fact, uh, the entire Bible is, is probably a third of it is prophecy. And uh, that's what shows who God is God, that he has that ability because he can uh, declare this and it will happen exactly to it under great specifics uh, later on in, in history. So, uh, um, what it is here is, is that we get the impression to read that all-knowing God who knows from the end to the beginning has inspired the book. Uh, he's given us his history in advance. And he's obviously in control of history today. He's in control of our world today. Uh, we don't need to be gripped with fear and, and panic the way the world is and the way the things that are happening. Uh, we see that. I see it on, on social media. I see all kind of friends, you know, all worried about everything that's going on in our world today. And, and there is some reason to worry about some things, but it's not really the worry that we, we worry about. We understand and should know uh, what things are going to happen. And all that. God tells us, he makes things, certain things clear in our, our Bible so that we will know and be prepared for them. And he doesn't want us to have no idea. And most people have really no idea as to what's really going on and why it's happening uh, in, in our world today. But we are uh, uh, so close uh, to, 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 uh, to the end. I mean, we can see it. We may have a few years left. I don't know, but I'm just saying we can see that. Most of us have the ability to see that and the spirit uh, pricking our hearts saying, hey, you know, it's time to, time to get serious because this is about over. We're not worried and gripped with fear because of it. If the stock market crashes, if wars occur, um, if all these things happen that's going to happen in our world, it's already turmoil in the Middle East. It's just instantly changed with the new uh, administration. Things have all changed. We see that, and then a lot of folks just get terrified of it. But not so the child of God, because we understand that God has revealed history. Um, uh, history is allowed under God's sovereignty to process or progress a certain way. And it's going to happen that certain way. Uh, not the way that a lot of them like to think that it's going to be. Uh, but like I say, they believe they'll be here forever. We've been here mi billions of years. We'll be here billions of years still. You know, I don't know. They don't know. Uh, that's all they got to live for us. So they don't know. But isn't it great to know that God's in control of the world, yeah. even when it looks like it's out of control? But it's not. It's not falling apart. Things are falling into place. <laughs> said it over and over again. It's falling into place. It's not going apart. Now, those who have no idea what the Bible says, they don't understand eschatology. 
Their pastor never preaches it. They never broach the subject. They go to church and don't even never talk about it. Uh, and it's just kind of like the banned thing to say. You don't talk nothing about it. They have no idea. Uh, they have no idea what's going to happen. They, they maybe have some weird idea, but they don't understand. And we should understand and know that it's all coming into place and, and be invigorated, enthused by that. But we see that Daniel had this uh, particular vision. He's in his 60s when this occurs. And you go, now wait a minute. <laughs> Wasn't it last week? He was in his 80s. <laughs> and now he's in his 60s. And also, last week, wasn't it the Medo-Persian Empire, Darius, you know, and the Persian Empire, wasn't he in charge? And now we're back to Belshazzar. What happened? Uh, what's, what's the deal here with, with that? Uh, am I just going, you know, picking up stuff crazy? But we have to understand that, that uh, uh, it is a little confusing. You leave chapter 6, the Persians are in control, and then you get into chapter 7, you go back and the Babylonians are in control. Did they go back and forth what? Well, remember, uh, our, our, our uh, uh, scripture, our, the book of Daniel isn't laid out, uh, it's laid out chiastically, remember? So it's not chronological, okay? So you have to go back and forth a little bit. So that's what's happening here. You have, uh, uh, <clears throat> we see that in, in, in the top of this edge, we have Gentile history in chapter 2, which meets with uh, chapter 7, has the same theme, Chapter uh, 3 and 6 <clears throat> have the same kind of theme. And then 4 and 5. So it's shaped like an X. Uh, and that was just the way that they did it. it it's, the, uh, Daniel is not chronologically uh, perfect. It's, it's not laid out this way. It's laid out chiastically. And that's crazy for us Western mind to figure out why would you do that. Because we start a story. We start at the beginning. We go to the end. Um, but they didn't do that. The Hebrews had this way of doing it where you would tie stuff together it's thematically. So it's a theme that is bringing together. So not everything is in direct uh, 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 chronological order that, that you're going to have. Uh, and that's just to understand that. So when you kind of jump around a, a little bit, that's just the, just the way it is. Um, so we see the succession of Gentile rulers uh, chapters 1 through 4 is Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. Chapter 5 is Belshazzar of Babylon. Chapter 6 is Darius of Medo Persia. 7 and 8 is back again, talking about Belshazzar of Babylon. 9 goes back to Darius of Media Persia. And then 10 and 12 is the last one of Media Persia, which is Cyrus of Persia. And Daniel lived through all of those, all of those successions. So uh, that's why it does that. It's, it's in, the, in that order. Um, so so uh, that's just the way it is. They're out of order chronologically. They're done uh, uh, thematically uh, so that we can understand that. So we go back in time uh, to when Daniel is, is having this, this dream. And um, so we also see this. We see uh, chapter 2 was the uh, uh, time of history, a description of it from Nebuchadnezzar's point of view, okay? It's a different time. He's looking at it, and he looks at our, our little chart here, and uh, he has that dream. They have the head of gold. Remember, the chest of arms of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, and the legs are, are iron, and the feet is mixed with iron and clay. So the bottom doesn't have a good structure, but yet the head of gold is top, and, and Daniel tells him, Nebuchadnezzar, you're that head of gold. You're it, which he thinks he's really awesome because of that. So he sees from his perspective as the conquering king, okay, all these good things. Now we see Daniel as he sees it from his perspective as, as not as the oppressor, but as the one who's oppressed. Okay, so we see history sometimes a little different. Isn't that interesting how you can do that? Uh, you may see history from one standpoint, but if you're another person, another person, uh, 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 in a, in a different part, you're going to see it completely different than the other people see it. Because, and that's the way Daniel is. He doesn't see uh, uh, gold and silver and bronze and all this beautiful statue. Uh, he sees terrible beasts. And, uh, uh, you know, it, the thing is, is, we understand a lot of times the things that we work for, we build, what we think look so great, aren't really so great to God. God's going to see them a different way. And Daniel certainly sees it a different way because he's the one and his, his uh, uh, people are the ones being oppressed. Um, 
Anyway, uh, Daniel is the author of the author certainly of this book, and it comes out again uh, uh, then. And that says uh, in in chapter uh, one says that he that Daniel wrote the dream down and related following the summary of it. That Daniel had the dream and he wrote it down. Now, like I say, when you're kids or you watch TV, you watch all these Christian with air quotes, definitely, you know, uh, uh, programs on like the History Channel or Discovery or those others that are never going to be uh, biblically accurate. But they'll have these uh, a professor from Harvard or some place, some very liberal, if they're, if they're from a seminary, it's an extremely liberal seminary and they're extremely liberal pay people, they'll say, Daniel didn't write this. And when you ask about this, when it says that Daniel wrote them down, they say, well, it doesn't, doesn't mean what it says. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. But I mean, uh, that's what that's the higher criticism is what it is. It's what it's called. Uh, they also have, a, we were talking with Bo this morning about Isaiah, and they think there's two or three Isaiahs. You know, pseudo Isaiah 1, pseudo Isaiah 2, 3 and 4. There's like four of them. I don't know. There's a whole handful of them. Well, there was another guy, pen name, right? They got run under the pen name of Isaiah. It wasn't him because he couldn't see all this stuff happen. And that's what they're going to teach at college. Or anywhere else, they'll have these guys with PhDs and they're super smart and they'll tell you all this stuff. Well, we know different. And, and yeah, we, 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 so that's not a big deal, but it is a big deal because your kids are being taught this. And uh, uh, grandkids or whatever, they're going to understand they're, the Bible's always uh, denigrated in public and denigrated by people who are supposedly uh, smart enough to know. But they'll tell you it doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean this. And it's constantly under attack. And uh, by smooth-talking people that can easily uh, lead somebody astray that doesn't, doesn't know anything. And how many of us, how many of our kids and grandkids really know anything about the Bible? You know? Uh, a lot of us don't read it. They don't know. They don't understand. They don't have any understanding of it. And, and so they just go by, by whatever. Uh, they don't understand it. If you don't know the Bible, you don't know God's character, you don't understand Him. And that's just all there is to it, because it's a revelation of God's character and what he has for his people. So um, he wrote the dream down. Um, another thing is, is, is uh, um, not just that, but Jesus said that Daniel wrote Daniel all the way down. In fact, uh, uh, I would believe Jesus, you know, he's a, he's a pretty good witness to say that <laughs> Daniel wrote it. I would say he's pretty accurate, uh, pretty reliable. And in Matthew 24, 15, he quotes Daniel 9, 27, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. He quotes Daniel the prophet. It was spoken by him, and he quotes that. So uh, that, that's pretty strong evidence that, that Daniel certainly had written everything here. Uh, and the reason they do that is because if Jesus can't be right on the things that, that, that we can see, um, how can I trust him for the things that we can't see? You know, the plan of salvation and faith and all that. You know, as a police officer, the first thing they do when you get in court is try to, to, to denigrate your testimony and try to show that you were wrong about something. You missed something or, or either you lied or you may not have lied if you didn't know and you didn't get something right. Uh, miss something and try to tear your credibility down because then if you can do that, say, hey, he wasn't accurate in this, so this other party can't be accurate in it. That's how they try to do that. And that's why they do that with this book and, and with uh, uh, Christians. But we see in verse 214 where we have the vision itself. The vision uh, uh, is, is we have the four beasts coming out of the sea. Uh, and we have a description of these four beasts. Um, and then we have a, a description of a character called the Ancient of Days. And then we have the vision concludes with the Son of Man and his presentation and establishment of his kingdom. But if we look at two and three, as we start to look at the actual vision itself, it says, Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night. Behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. The four beasts were coming up out of the sea. They were different from each other. They were diverse. And what does he see in this vision? He's going to see these various empires that will trample down the nation of Israel during this time of captivity. It's a time period that we have called the, the, the times of the Gentiles. It's a time when, when the nation of Israel has no reigning king on David's throne. Zedekiah was the last king of Judah. He was deposed by Nebuchadnezzar back in 586 B.C. And that inaugurated this time in history. We, we would, know, would know virtually nothing about it if God hadn't raised up Daniel. 
we wouldn't know anything much about that time. It's a time of, of, of mystery uh, in that it's a brand new <clears throat> time period. There's no prior revelation about this. Uh, Daniel's raised up specifically by God to give the details prophetically of this time period. Uh, Israel's going to be trampled down by various powers. And that's going to continue all the way till when? We've said it before. When's it going to continue to? All the way until God's kingdom is on earth. That's when Jesus comes and puts his feet on the Mount of Olives and it splits in two and he, he destroys every sinner in the entire earth is wiped out. That's, Dan, that's uh, Matthew chapter 24 and 25 where one is taken, one is left. He takes the sinners out. They're gone. Comes to the thief in the night. Okay, That's not a good thing, though it used to be. We used to think it was. We, we didn't know any better then. But he's coming as a thief in the night for Israel. And he's going to take those people out. He's going to rule with a rod of iron from Jerusalem. And we'll be with him, ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years. That is the only time is when the, uh, the, the times of the Gentiles will end. Okay, so that will continue all the way through. Uh, Israel is still being trampled down and, and will all the way through. We say, well, you know, uh, uh, won't the uh, Antichrist have a, have a, you know, get a temple built there? Yeah, but it's still going to be trampled down by Gentiles. There's still going to be, be something going on there. Uh, so it won't be, it won't be, <laughs> it won't be a, 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 a good king. It'll be, uh, it'll be the, uh, Satan himself. So we see that, and, and uh, it'll be there until that time. Um, Daniel was raised up specifically uh, uh, for that. Um, you notice these, these beasts, they, they represent these, these different Gentile powers. Uh, what is the sea? Uh, what are they talking about? Well, in, a lot of times in the Bible, uh, the sea generally means or represents a great mass of humanity, uh, uh, the great mass of the human race. Isaiah 57, 21 says, but the wicked are like the tossing of the sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up refuse and mud. And that's how God looks at human history. Uh, with the Gentiles in control, it's a bunch of refuse and mud. Uh, just as constant churning. And these four beasts are coming up out of the sea. Um, we know that the Antichrist, the beast in Revelation 13, 1, is also portrayed as coming up out of the sea. Uh, it says, Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns were ten diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. 17.1 uh, talks about a great harlot, the end time system of the Antichrist and his city and, and the system it says. It says, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, the sea. Uh, what is the sea? Uh, 1715 says, Revelation 1715 says, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes, nations and tongues. So it's defined for us what the sea is in Revelation. Of course, we find that even here, uh, we try to figure out what these beasts are. Well, God gives us a, 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 a explanation as we read further. Uh, that's one thing when you're looking at the uh, study of the Bible is there something doesn't isn't explained. It's probably explained at a different spot in the Bible. It, it usually is. It will interpret itself if you will read all of it and not just uh, pick things out of it. Uh, so typically in the Bible, but not every single time, the sea or the ocean is, is a great mass of humanity that's in its fallen condition and, and, and churning. So... Uh, uh, yet from the sea are going to come forth these specific empires. Uh, they'll be named in the book of Daniel. And these are the empires that's going to trample down the nation of Israel during this time of the Gentiles. Nebuchadnezzar saw this time period. He saw it from man's perspective. Daniel, on the other hand, in the same time period, it is him, he's seeing it from God's perspective, which is completely different. So when Nebuchadnezzar was given information about the times of the Gentiles, he saw it as a beautiful statue, dazzling in appearance, a, a beautiful head of gold, chest and arms of silver, all these things he thought was, was great, was beautiful in appearance. But uh, uh, Daniel sees the exact same period of time, but he doesn't see it as a beautiful statue. He sees it uh, as, as, as these uh, disgusting, grotesque, uh, you know, a ferocious beast. He saw a lion and a bear and a leopard. And, uh, and, and he saw the end, in the end, he saw this terrifying beast. So 
Why the difference in perspective? Well, from Nebuchadnezzar's perspective, it's a great time period there in chapter 2. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar's in charge, so it is a great time period. Don't we love to be in charge? We love to everything be going great for us. So he's thinking, yeah, it's awesome. The thing's going great. Um, it's beautiful. But the perspective changes when the same information is given to Daniel, who's a Hebrew, a Jew. It's not a, 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 a beautiful time. It's a terrible time because he's not the oppressor. He's the oppressed. Um, and, you know, that's just the way it is. In, in history, you look at it from a different points of view, from different people. They're going to see those things a little differently than, than others are from th their point of view. Um, and each one has that, but God has his own point of view, which is, which is completely different. Um, we look at uh, 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 the history of, of the United States, and there's a lot of things you can say from different perspectives as to how it came about and all that. Uh, but I, I believe in God's perspective as the United States was, uh, was raised up as it originally was, was created to propagate the gospel and to help Israel. Um, the whole thing in the end is to, to get the gospel out there. And I believe that that's why the United States was raised up and why all the things happen now and the things that are occurring are for Israel and for God's uh, uh, end time perspective and, and his, his plan that he's going to have. Everybody plays into it. Every country, every ruler, everybody plays into it. Whether they understand it or know it or not, that's the way it is. The things that uh, our previous president did were for Israel. The things that this president now is doing or somebody is doing through him, <laughs> I think it's someone else, anyway, are doing that uh, for Israel because it's all about them towards the end, right? It's all about them. They're the burdensome stone. Jerusalem is the burdensome stone that's going to be to all the nations. All we're worried about is peace over there and this and that. It's, all, it's everything. Nothing else matters. It's all about them. There's a little bitty tiny country nobody should even care about, but every nation does. Uh, but anyway, uh, 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 it's all a different perspective as we see. Uh, History is narrated in Daniel 2 as, as a beautiful statue, but in Daniel 7, the same period of time as through these four beasts. And it's, and it's not the same uh, uh, to Daniel. He's looking at it through the, the Jewish uh, perspective and all. So we see in verse 4, the beast number 1 is like a lion with the wings of an eagle. I kept looking till its wings were plucked. It was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind was given to it. The first beast that Daniel saw would, would trample Israel down during this difficult time was going to be a lion. Now we know exactly who uh, this is because the lion is identical with the head of gold in the information that Nebuchadnezzar received back in Daniel chapter 2. In fact, in, in, in Daniel 2.38, we know exactly who the head of gold is because it says to Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold, okay? So we know that in our chart, well, the, the head is, is, is fine gold and it's going to be uh, Nebuchadnezzar. It's a Babylonian. Uh, Daniel sees it as the, the lion with the wings of an eagle. Um, so that tells us right away uh, who that is. Um, and... Um, um, then Babylon is, is, uh, is trampled down, uh, uh, Babylon trampled down the nation of Israel 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. So that's in Daniel's lifetime he would see that and we would see that prophecy uh, begin to be fulfilled years later. Uh, in chapter 5, the days of Babylon would come to an end and be replaced by Persia. So it's interesting that God gave Daniel this vision and he got to actually see his own prophecy being, uh, 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 you know, made good at the end, being, being realized. He knew that it would happen. It just builds your faith so much more when God explains something to you or gives you something, and then you see it happen. Uh, when, you, when he sees this, he had no idea, doesn't understand, but he, he sees that happen and experiences that. He knows for sure. That it builds faith. And we wonder why he had such strong faith too, how he did that. Well, he firsthand was able to see uh, uh, God making good and fulfilling that. Um, and we see that he has eagle's wings. That's most likely in reference to a very rapid, swift conquest of Babylon as she came to power and subjugated the nation of Israel, and she did. Um, we'll know that it looked like a man who, who uh, uh, had been plucked. It's almost like his life had been interrupted uh, to to make him stand on his feet uh, and a man's mind or a human mind 
was given to that individual. And that's a description of what happened to Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4. Uh, that's when uh, 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 the first reigning king during that time, you remember him, he had the bad case, bad case of the eyes. I did this, I did that, I've done this, I, 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 I. You know, he was really proud of himself. Uh, and, and then uh, uh, in, in 430, he said, this was the great Babylonian empire, which I myself have created from my majesty. I'm somebody. Uh, and, uh, and he has done it all. He's built it all. And then God turned him into an insane man for seven years. Um, he lived like an animal. Uh, that's uh, supposed to be medically, that's supposed to be uh, uh, an actual disease like lycanthropy or something like that, where people actually think and act like animals. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think young people like that, a lot of, a lot of kids <laughs> like that already, think they have the disease. But anyway, uh, uh, that, that's something that could have happened and probably happened to, to, to him. But we see that Daniel kept looking at this particular vision. The territory that Neo-Babylonia controlled, it was the empire of that time period, it was the conquest of the known world. Nobody ever thought in their wildest dreams <coughs> that Neo-Babylonia would have had in its day, in, have its day in the sun, and then, and then disappear and be gone. But I can tell you that most people think that our country, the greatest thing in the world, I think it's the greatest country in the world, and has been, I think it'll be there forever. It won't be. There's not any country that stays. Uh, there's only one that has dominion forever. Uh, and it's not occurred yet. But it won't be like anything else. Uh, that's just the way it is. It's not going to go on and on and on. It can't. And, and all the, 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 the fall of man and all the sin that's in our world, we see it just getting worse and worse. The corruption that's in our world today and amongst our world leaders. And, and it's just everywhere. It's just so much corruption. Um, it just doesn't matter everywhere. They just can't, can't seem to get around it. When you think somebody's done something, the government has done something, has been a good thing, you look into it, next thing you know, you find out there was all kind of corrupt dealings going on. And right now, we all know that everything is just, it's just completely corrupt. Every deal, everything, everything done, it's just almost, uh, there's always somebody that's getting a benefit out of it that doesn't deserve it or whatever. Uh, it's just going on. But we see that, that uh, uh, Neo-Babylonia was replaced by Medo-Persia in a single night without even a battle. And that's how vulnerable they were, and they had no understanding, no idea that they, they were, couldn't understand that. And it moves us into the second part of the vision. Another beast, a second one resembling a bear. It was raised up on one side, three ribs were in its mouth, between its teeth, and thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. Then the lions followed by the bear. Uh, we know the bear is Persia because the book of Daniel itself identifies Persia. Uh, Medo-Persia is the empire that would follow Babylon. Uh, Daniel 5, 28, we'll see the name Persia. Daniel 8, 28, you'll see the name Persia. Daniel 10, 13, the name Persia. And 10, 20 is Persia. Uh, uh, and in 528 it says Peres, P-R-E-S your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and Persians that's, that's uh, uh, the explanation there in 1013 the pri a prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days when behold Michael one of the chief priests the princes came to help me for I had been with, uh, uh, left there with the king of Persia we see that uh, 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 the angel had to fight there's, there's a, a spirit or a demon uh, angel, a fallen angel, who's been assigned Persian, who's, who's probably still there. I mean, that's what they do. Uh, uh, Satan and his angels are very uh, organized. If you study an angelology, you realize that they're very organized. And uh, he was fighting uh, with them, and he had to get, get some help. Had to get another angel to help fight him to take, take news back. So, um, and, uh, you know, the prince of Greece was about to come. So we see that in there. We'll be covering that as we go through, through Daniel. So we see that, that, that the Holy Spirit is so specific that he's going to give you the name of the empire that's going to follow Babylon. And, and the bear would parallel the chest and the arms of silver that Nebuchadnezzar saw back in chapter 2. That's an empire that would come to power in Daniel's day, uh, beginning around 539 B.C. Uh, 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 the change between Babylon and Persia is Daniel 5, and it would last all the way to uh, 331 B.C. It's an empire that Daniel uh, uh, saw would replace Babylon. And that exchange happened during his lifetime. And he keeps in the Persian Empire in his vision, uh, lasting long after Daniel died, uh, lasting all the way to 331. 
And so he saw these things 200 years, about 200 years before Persia went out of power. Daniel saw these things in 553 B.C. Um, and, and that's what God does. He gives us things in advance. You'll notice that the bear's got three ribs in its mouth. Well, what are they? Um, we don't know 100% for sure, but an educated guess is either the provinces of Persia uh, that they conquered as she was rising uh, to power over Babylon. She conquered Lydia, number one, Babylon, number two, then Egypt, number three. Um, and we'll see that God told this, uh, uh, told in his vision in the Persian Empire to arise like a bear and devour. And that's exactly what they did. Uh, it had a geographical area that was expanded even beyond what Nebuchadnezzar had brought in under Babylon. And you'll notice that the Persian Empire doesn't come to power until God gives it permission to come to power. Um, you kind of get this idea that God's pulling the strings. <laughs> he knows what's going on. Uh, uh, <clears throat> he, he knows what's going on. He, he has this purpose. What's his purpose? His purpose is to bring the nation of Israel out of captivity and back into their land. Because remember, they're only here for 70 years. His, his, his judgment is always, it's not forever, because that's what we would do. We would uh, uh, do that, but he's taking care of his own people. And he knows that he's going to be able to get them, but he's going to, it's going to be 70 years. And so uh, uh, that they're going to come back, and he's got to have a way to get them back into the land. And so uh, uh, God is going to take care of it. He's going to fulfill his promises and fulfill his prophecies. Um. Isaiah 44, 28 is the very last verse in chapter 44. It says uh, uh, in that, and then the first verse of 45, God says, let me give you even more information. Uh, he says, it is, I, uh, it, it is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built. And of the temple, your foundation will be laid. So he makes that. 45, 1 says, thus says the Lord to Cyrus, is anointed whom I've taken by the right hand to subdue nations before him and to loose the loins of kings and to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. So he's, he's moving Cyrus to do all these things and uh, he already tells him what's going to happen. Uh, he gives us that name of the Persian leader uh, who's going to come in and allow Israel to come back into their land. Uh, you know, uh, Cyrus is, is uh, really held up uh, uh, by the Jews now is allowing them to do that. I don't know if you all remember, but uh, uh, there's a temple coin that the, uh, Israel the, ha has made for the temple that they're going to build soon, they hope. Uh, but it has a picture of Cyrus on that temple coin that they will use for uh, bringing the temple. And superimposed on that image of Cyrus is another image of somebody that we know. And that image is of Donald Trump because he moved the uh, capital there and what he's done for Israel. They superimposed Donald Trump over the, the uh, uh, image of Cyrus, so they're double there, Cyrus and Trump. And they related him to the same as like a Cyrus who allowed them to do all these things. And so uh, they, they really uh, uh, do think a lot of Cyrus because he, he allowed them to come back into their land. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, that happened about 200 years before it happened. Um, but you know, like I say, the liberals can't believe that Isaiah could have wrote that. <laughs> you know, it was a, a pseudo Isaiah. Uh, and and they, they still still go that. And liberal seminaries, liberal colleges teach, teach the same thing uh, that, that will do that. But uh, um, Ezekiel and his prophecy saw Persia turning against Israel. And he probably thought these prophecies were crazy because Persia was a good guy. All the way through, Persia has been an ally and, and a good ally, a friend. Uh, it, it was an ally of Israel. But Ezekiel sees the end times, uh, sees the turning of, of Persia. Um, and we see that um, uh, that Persia is going to be coming against them. Who is Persia now? It's Iran. Uh, that that uh, didn't happen all that long ago with a name change. And, and, uh, prior to 1979, Ezekiel's prophecies of the turning of Persia probably seemed crazy to a lot of people because they were always an ally. And everything changed in the Islamic Revolution in 1979. Um, all those things changed. The Shah was deposed and, and, and everything thing took over. Um, God was moving his hand in history. He was allowing the uh, stage to be set up for the end time drama when Persia herself, according to Ezekiel's prophecy, would not be an ally 
of Israel, but would in fact launch a last day's attack from the north along with Rosh and others against the nation of Israel. And so we see that in Ezekiel 38 and 39, we have Persia, which is Iran, we have Russia, we have Turkey, and uh, we have uh, Libya, we have Sudan, which is interesting, their president now signed a, a, a normalization agreement with, with uh, uh, Israel, but that won't last long, but we see that and all the other nations with him will come against Israel. Um, and we know that, that right now, Iran are doing everything they can to wipe Israel off the map. They want them gone, they want us gone, and they, they'll do everything they can to get a nuke to where they can or whatever. Um, but but uh, uh, the, the leadership certainly is, is, is not a blessing uh, to Israel in any way. But Daniel kept looking at this vision. He saw yet another animal. This is the form of the leopard. And if you look at verses, chapter 7 and verse 6, it says, After this I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast <clears throat> also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And see how it keeps saying that dominion is given. The empires don't come until God moves his hand and allows them to come forth. And uh, uh, this third empire be the empire of Greece, represented by a leopard. Um, he said, well, where are we getting Greece from? Well, uh, 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 here are the verses that give you Greece by name as the empire that would follow Persia in the book of Daniel. Daniel 8, 21, you'll see the word Greece. Uh, Daniel 10, 20, uh, you'll see that Greece would follow the Persian empire. And, and 8, 21, the, the, Daniel 8, 21, the shaggy goat represents the kingdom of Greece. And the large horn, that is the one between his eyes, is the first king. And Daniel 10, 20 says, uh, do you know why I've come? Uh, soon I must return to fight against the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. And after that, the spirit of the uh, prince of the kingdom of Greece will come. So Nebuchadnezzar saw this time uh, back in Daniel 2. And to him appeared as, as a belly of thighs and bronze. Uh, Greece, beginning with Alexander the Great, around 30, 331 BC, would arise to power. And he would conquer the known world. And that's the empire of Greece. Uh, that's what's happening during this uh, uh, intertestamental time period, the time between the testaments. It's occurring, all that's going on. Uh, the time between Malachi and Matthew. And uh, why is it that when you see the uh, close the pages of the Old Testament, the Persians are in power and everybody's speaking Hebrew or Aramaic, you open know, the pages of the New Testament and Rome is in power and everybody's speaking Greek. Uh, well, there's history there. There's things that happened. And this is what's during that time that's happened. He revealed, God revealed in advance what he was going to do to, to set the table or set the stage for the advent of his son, Jesus Christ. He allowed all that to happen. The leopard has four wings and most likely speaking of the rapid conquest of Alexander the Great who brought the Grecian Empire to power. He toppled Persia in the process. We know Alexander the Great he conquered the no world, well, uh, you know, and he, he, he actually started to weep because he had nothing else to conquer. That's all he wanted to do was to conquer and to go. It's a man who, who died around age 30 to 33 uh, of sexually transmitted diseases and, uh, and all that that he had was wrong with him. He's a man that could conquer the world, but he couldn't conquer his own passions and lusts. He was prematurely snuffed out when he was young. And then Alexander the Great becomes the focus of, of Daniel's prophecies in Daniel chapter 8 through 11. And the dates for the Grecian Empire will be 331 B.C. to 63 B.C. Daniel saw all of this in 553 B.C. nearly 200 years before it happened. And uh, the power of the Bible is to, to, to reveal the, the beginning and the, the, the end. The end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. But uh, uh, Daniel 7, 6 makes reference to four heads. And he said, I kept looking, behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on his back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. It's interesting that when uh, Alexander the Great died, he had no heirs. He was too young, didn't have any heirs, nothing to take on his kingdom. And so it was split up between his four generals. We know that from history. And the Bible tells us that, that it split up between his four generals and they, they took that, which is uh, uh, pretty interesting. Um, the generals who, who are in charge is Cassander, who got control of Macedonia, uh, one part of, of his empire. The second general is, is uh, Lysimachus, I can't probably pronounce it, 
who got control of Thrace and Asia Minor. And another uh, uh, part of that, uh, the third empire becomes Seleucus, who got control of Syria to the, the north of Israel and to the uh, northern part of, of Israel to Alexander the Great. And the fourth general was uh, Ptolemy, who got control of Egypt and, to the nation of, and the nation of Israel south of there. And so Daniel's prophecies that we move in, Cassandra and Lysimachus, they drop off the radar screen. Daniel begins to focus on Seleucus and Ptolemy because from Seleucia is going to become the Seleucid dynasty and from Ptolemy is going to become the Ptolemy dynasty. And these two empires uh, do battle going back and forth all across the promised land. And you can see uh, based on their location, they're just continually fighting it out. Uh, and, and Daniel chapter 11 gives us really uncanny information about that time period with specific detail long before it happened. Uh, in fact, again, that's a, a spot where the liberals just can't stand it. They, they, they can't stand it because it's, it has such detail. But the Seleucid dynasty is going to come under Antiochus uh, IV or, or Antiochus, however you want to pronounce it, uh, 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 and all that. Uh, uh, and, and Antiochus uh, Epiphanes or Antiochus Epiphanes, however you say it, uh, that's a name that we should know. That's a, 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 the, the means, his name means God manifested. There's not a you know, big ego problem issue right there. But he's going to come into the land of Israel and he's going to desecrate the temple as, and God's going to perform a great liberation of the temple during that time period uh, that the Jews are still calling uh, Hanukkah. Remember, uh, he's going to be able to uh, do that. The Feast of Lights or Feast of Dedication. <clears throat> that's where that occurred at. It's a holiday that uh, uh, is not found in, in Leviticus. It's not originally one to follow, but it's one that they followed because God did such a, a great way of rescuing his people during that time period. In fact, Jesus goes to Jerusalem in John 10, 22 to celebrate Hanukkah. And uh, that's the Feast of Dedication which took place in Jerusalem. So we see all these prophecies here in 7, 8, and 11. They're, they're uh, uh, getting into become the prophetic basis for that, for that holiday. Um, moving to the last empire right quick, Rome. Uh, Daniel 7, 7, it says, After this I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong. It had large iron teeth that devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with his feet. And, and uh, 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 this is a terrible beast. It's Empire Rome. And how do you know it's Rome, he saw? Well, it's Rome because um, from the secular history that Rome followed Greece. It's just a matter of historical fact. Rome's uh, uh, not mentioned in the way that Persia and, and Greece is, but yet we know as a matter of fact that Rome did follow Greece. That's the legs of iron that Nebuchadnezzar saw in Daniel 2, the two legs of iron. Uh, why is there two legs? Because there's an eastern division of the Roman Empire and a western division of the Roman Empire. It's an empire to come into power in 63 BC as, as the general Pompey okay, would come into the land of Israel and subjugate the nation of Israel. Uh, and, and it's an empire that would continue to trample down the nation of Israel until AD 70. And remember in AD 70, that's when, when Israel's pushed out of the land again. That's when uh, Antiochus Epiphanes went into to, uh, uh, the temple and desecrated that and, and all that. I think he was a type of, uh, of the uh, Antichrist that will do that also in the, in the tribulation period. But uh, it will uh, mimic a lot of the things that were going on, but they were, they were kicked out at that time. So Rome is an is, is, is a, a, a extremely wicked empire. It's one of the most wicked empires the human race ever saw. Um, and, and uh, uh, you know, they were responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. But uh, they didn't get that uh, on their own. They didn't come up with their own. They saw it was started by the Assyrians. And then uh, uh, Rome just made it even worse. They, they, they made it worse where it would draw uh, their, their time out and basically torture them even more. But they did all kinds of stuff. Rome was a, a horrible, uh, uh, extremely wicked uh, uh, empire. And uh, it, it, it's, it was just some of the things that they did. Uh, you remember Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh? <laughs> he had a good reason for not wanting to go to Nineveh because of the way they would torture people, the way they would try to kill them. And uh, uh, he didn't want to go to the Assyrians because that's where they you know, got that from, this, this crucifixion and all. And uh, 
Yes, he would, God told him to, and God would have protected him, but you, we need to, a lot of times we don't understand when we read the Bible. Why? Because he thought, man, if I didn't, if I don't not successful, something happens, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna die a horrible, painful death for a long time. Uh, you know, they would put people to death, so he didn't want to have a part of it. And uh, of course, God uh, did preach to them, and they they did repent for a little while. But uh, we see that Rome is that way; that they're extremely uh, uh, evil and all. And, and but they're they're in place for a reason. All this history is tying together because God's in control, and He's going to put them there. Because guess who has to be crucified? His Son, Jesus Christ, to be able to pay for our sins. God started this from the beginning. He understood how things would happen and, and laid it all out. He, he has everything under control. And I'm going to tell you, so many times, all we can see is just a very small part of what's going on. We, we can only, like my mom used to say, you can't see past the nose on your face. <laughs> you know, Sometimes we can't see in, ahead into anything. We think about all our own circumstances, all our own things that are happening, and it's all me, 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 you know, and why me and all that. Well, we don't understand that the, there's a big picture out there that God is doing to, to uh, uh, bring glory to him and to, of course, uh, uh, to, for salvation. And that's what he did. Over all these things that are occurring, uh, and he's occurring with the, uh, uh, Rome that's happening, is happening because he's going to bring his son to be able to come and to save us. And uh, he's in control of everything. So it, it's, it's hard for us to understand sometimes because we get caught up in all this. And our culture uh, completely is all about what's happening here. It places all the importance on what we're doing here and what's happening here when we should be putting all our importance on what's going to happen in the end. What's going to happen to the judgment seat of Christ? How many crowns is God going to give me to lay at his feet at the, at the, at the uh, Bema seat judgment? That's where I want to know because that's, that's, that's all we're talking about is... is is the, the eternal aspect of where we're going to be. Um, he has done so much for us. He has, has saved us from our sins. He was that perfect sacrifice so that we might be able to give our lives to him and, and not have to go through any judgment. The Bible tells us that we are free from judgment. The, the, the judgment seat of Christ is not one of, of, of uh, coming down on you. It's one of, of rewards. There'll be those who really don't have anything to lay down at his feet. There are those who have a lot to lay down at Jesus' feet. And that's what it's about. We all get to get there. It's like graduating. We all graduate, but some get a little more than others. Some get a little more scholarship. Some get a few more awards for what they did through their time. Others are just getting <laughs> glad to get out of school. And uh, I understand that's the way it will be. But none of us have to suffer any judgment whatsoever uh, 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 from Jesus. Um, that is so important. We do. We pass from that. We are no longer condemned. We are condemned already because we haven't given our life to Him. But once we give our life to Him, we follow Him. We pass through that judgment. He saves us from that. That's the whole point of what He did. He took all that sin on the cross on Himself and paid for our sin debt. All that previous, all that present, and all that will be future. And He did that for us. He became sin for us is what the Bible says. And he paid that debt. So I would say it today, if you have an opportunity, if you haven't done that, and you, you see all the things that are going on in the world today, and you're starting to get concerned, you're starting to get worried about all these things, you know, and, and wonder how come a lot of the Christians aren't worried so much, <laughs> and how come what's different about them? It's because we understand what's going on. We understand that, what's, that we have someone who died to save us, and that we're going to live forever with him, and we know that no matter what happens, how bad it gets, we're going to get taken care of. Uh, we're going to be okay. We understand that. So I would encourage you to, to give your heart to Christ, uh, give it to Him, and, and to follow Him. Just recognize who He is and to be saved and, and, and work for Him while the time that we have here. Let's pray. Father, we just thank You so much. It's a, a lot of stuff to cover in, in, in uh, this, this uh, uh, vision, and, and some of it's kind of confusing, but, but Father, it's very important because we're going to see more of this occurring ahead. And we need to know and understand the Bible. All of the Bible is, is, is very important. There's no extraneous information in it. And we know that, that you put it there for us to know and to understand. Father, I just pray that you would just uh, help us to understand that you are in control. You're in control of, of, of history. 
in control of what's going to happen in our world today, in our nation today, and uh, things can be very unsettling. But Father, that those of us who have a relationship with you can, can uh, rely completely on you and trust in you for everything. We thank you for all that you've done for us. Uh, pray, Father, you just work in and through us uh, so that we might propagate the gospel uh, to all that we'll hear and all that we're uh, in our influence uh, throughout this week. We thank you. We love you. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone stand and turn to